what are the symptoms that a company is in trouble? This is important even if you don't have a company because things get worse before they get better. At the beginning, you are putting in a lot of money and you have all kinds of problems and you don't have the experience, you don't have an established base of clientele. And then if you survive for a year or two, things start getting a lot more stable and they start getting a lot of better, and they start getting a lot better, but you just have to make it through this initial point. So some, and these things are not a problem. Financial issues are not a problem as long as you recognize them early on and you don't start doing terrible things like not submitting your sales taxes and spending the last dime that you have in the bank account and taking merchant cash advances and potentially borrowing on your credit card and doing all kinds of things that are gonna get you buried. So the important thing is recognizing early on you're in over your head and then just getting out so that you have enough time to readjust and get back to business. And the people who are on top of their finances and who do this don't tend to have nearly as much problems as people who are blind optimists. So um, this is some of the typical problems people have, and we're going to talk about ways to stop yourself from getting in this, is being regularly behind on servicing your debt, being late on your taxes, unable to cover repairs or replacements of equipment, cannot pay salaries, cash flow issues, sale, sales are flat or declining, material costs are going up, employees quitting because they're depressed because they see what's going on in the company, and so on and so forth. Those are the kinds of issues that can creep up on you. So um, now these are some of the first contracts that you're going to be signing, and these contracts come with substantial risks that you may not be aware of even if you hire a lawyer. By far the most dangerous contract you're going to sign is your commercial lease agreement. We're going to get in a little more into this later, but commercial lease agreements are so dangerous for several reasons. The first thing is they're expensive. Your commercial lease could easily be a minimum of $2,500 for a very small space. I have a lot of clients who are starting out who are paying $8,500 a month because they're in manufacturing and they need to be in a little bit better location with a little bit better facilities and closer to the people who would buy the product and so they have no choice and now that's fine because people have a budget but what what happens is that's not the only expense in a commercial lease that can be the base rent then on top of that there's going to be a lot of other expenses built in including your share of the increase in the landlord's rent your share of, of utilities your share of maintenance your share of taxes I'm sorry to say rent I meant taxes the, the landlord's taxes before so you know, you're going to be facing all of these things in addition to the base rent. So that can get very expensive. And what's worse is if you're unable to pay any of these things, or if the landlord alleges that you owe expenses that you don't owe, then the acceleration clause ends up kicking in, which means you owe all the money on the commercial lease right up front. So you may be paying 5,000 a month over 10 years, but now all of a sudden in month three there's a dispute and you owe 5,000 times 120 months all at once. And the landlord is now suing you for a six digit sum and you're sitting here like, how did we get to this point? And it happens that easily. I had someone who called me and this was an interesting example where his commercial lease specified that he pays his prorated share of the total amount of space in the building for utilities. So in other words, if he's got 10% of the space in the building, he pays 10% of the total utility costs for the building. Sounds fine, until the landlord decided to rent to a car wash next door. And so what happened? The car wash is going nuts using water and electricity and they, it wouldn't surprise me if the landlord owned the car wash. And so what ends up happening is they say, all right, you need to pay your 10%. And he's like, whoa, 10% of the car wash's expenses? Are they giving me 10% of the cash they're taking in down there? No way, dude, read your lease. And so he calls, what am I going to do now? Like, I don't know, because this is not residential where you have a lot of protections. This is commercial where whatever the lease says is what they're going to enforce. So when you look at a contract, 
that's been evaluated by a good lawyer versus a contract that's been evaluated by a not so good lawyer. The difference is like every line is going to have some form of editing in it because every line is so dangerous and it's all stacked against you. So, I mean, a lot of times, like when I finish going through a lease, there's just pages and pages of red line. And then the landlord will say, well, a lot of lawyers just sign it the way it is. And like an eight out of 10 small businesses go out of business. What's your point here? You know, we're gonna figure something out, but we have to make sure that everything is commercially reasonable, that there's some way out of it, and so on and so forth. So that, I've dedicated this time to talking about that because commercial leases are dangerous. And I do a lot of bankruptcy, and this is the number one reason people file bankruptcy, is to kill off their liability, their personal liability, on their commercial lease, because the landlords typically insist that you sign personally in order to get the uh, lease so they can hold you liable. Now there's ways to negotiate around that, by putting up more security, or by putting in a clause known as a good guy clause, which basically states that you can leave after giving the landlord a certain amount of notice and you'll be personally liable up until that point, but after that point you no longer have personal liability, there's still things the landlord can do, but you have to try to negotiate these things ahead of time. Next thing is employment contracts. The city council here in New York City passes new employee rights laws, it seems like every week nowadays, and the state is also pretty busy. The federal government, not as much, but the federal government's been going for a lot longer. The federal government has a lot more experience with these laws. And while it may seem wonderful as an employee, and there's a lot of wonderful things about it, the problem is that the penalties for even a technical violation of a lot of these laws don't fit the crime. You might not pay an employee for overtime because you did not even know they were working overtime. And then all of a sudden, someone calls up the government and they say, I worked 100 hours of overtime and I was not paid. And you're like, what overtime? I would never allow overtime. And the law still specifies that even if you didn't know about it, you're still liable for it. So then you show up before the Department of Labor like, oh, you've done a bad thing. Like, but I had no idea. And it doesn't matter. You still broke the law. And so then people end up showing up and like, I got this nasty fine from the Department of Labor. I can't pay this. And so we need to figure out what we're going to do. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into employment agreements here, but you just need to be very careful. You either need to use a very good lawyer or be very good at using Google and make sure that you specify or that you have a good employee handbook and that you specify in the contract that there is no overtime without specific written permission from the company and that you enforce that rule by not allowing people to stay late. If you see any evidence that people have been doing work after hours, you need to say, I appreciate that, but you have to stick to your hours. And this can be very insidious because at the beginning, when you're struggling, everyone is cheering you on. The employees are working a lot of extra hours. Everyone's trying to help you because everyone wants you to succeed because everyone wants you to be successful, just not more successful than they are. But that turns around really quickly after praying and starving and praying and starving and working and all of these things, one day you just get a good break. Something positive happens and you, know, you get a nice order and your situation gets a little bit better. And then all of a sudden everyone is like, wow, that's a pretty nice order. And they don't know what you've been going through. They don't know how behind you are on your SBA loans. They don't know what your credit card bill looks like. They don't know any of these things. Everyone's just talking to each other like, whoa, did you see that order that just came in? I think raises are coming. And you know, then you're like, I'm not in a position to give a raise. People are like, but I worked so hard for you. I work 90 hours a week. I'm entitled to overtime. And then all of a sudden, you know, and this is just one of a hundred things that people can bring up. When I say one of a hundred, I'm being conservative. There's probably 10,000 things you can think of if that's what you want to do. So um, 
basically, once you start to become even a little successful, everybody's out to get you. That's what it's going to be. And so, welcome. I, I like to say to people, I've got good news and I've got bad news for you about starting a business. The good news is that if you're committed and you want to make one million or five million or ten million, you'll do it. You will be able to. This is a great country. This is a great city. There's a lot of money here and it's completely doable. Many people have sat in this room who have gone on to make millions and that's not the last group of people who've sat in this room and done exactly that. That's the good news. The bad news is when you get there, you'll probably be bitter and angry and injured and resentful and not appreciative of the point that you've gotten because so many relationships will have been destroyed by that point. So many people will have broken your heart, including people in your family, your best friends, everyone that you can think of that should have your back will put another knife into it with 99% probability, probability which is why so many rich people are so nasty and selfish. Like they didn't start that way a lot of the time, but it's just been one knife after the next, after the next. And eventually people just walk around like, what are you gonna do to me now? And you know, so that's the good news and that's the bad news about how success typically works. Um, and then you've got independent contractor agreements. Very important point here, when you've got an independent contractor agreement, you have to make sure that there's a work for hire clause when you hire someone. If you don't have that, then they're gonna own the intellectual property for the work that you've done, uh, for the work that you've paid them to do. It may be a lot of your ideas, but if they're the one who made it tangible, then they're gonna be the ones who own it. Now, like you might have a computer app company or something like that, where this could be highly problematic because you can't afford to have an employee doing your coding. You hire an outside contractor to do the coding. You have all these ideas, they code the whole thing up, you pay them for the work, and then all of a sudden, they're out selling the app to 20 other people. Like, dude, what are you doing? It's like, oh, well, it's mine, I wrote it, literally, I wrote it, it's mine. Like, so you, as the person who thought of it and paid them, you have a limited license to use it. You can use it for your business, but they're going to be more the owner than you are unless you change that with a work for hire clause. And there's a lot of companies, particularly web hosting companies and development companies, small businesses don't usually do this, but larger businesses love to do it, where they'll literally extort you for your own property. You go to change to change web hosting companies or something like that. They take out the contract and they'll be like, well, we own, every, um, we own every line of code that you posted to your website. Well, how is that possible? Well, did you read the contract? And you, know, you have an outside agreement with them and that's just the way it works. So point being, you need to be very careful about this kind of thing too, where you could find yourself in difficult negotiations over that. Um, Similarly, you need to make sure that your independent contractors don't claim to be your employee. This is a very common thing. There's something called the badges that they look at to determine if someone is a 1099 contractor or a W-2 employee. You should have an agreement specifying that someone is a contractor, but regardless, if they're acting more like an employee than an independent contractor, they can nail you to the wall for not having all the proper benefits and not giving the proper paid time off and all this stuff because they were actually an employee. And that can come out in a very unfortunate situation. So you really just need to be careful. Like if you've got someone working 40 hours a week for you and they're sitting in your office and you're telling them what to do, if it's just obvious that they're your employee, then you wanna just make them a W-2 employee sooner rather than later. If someone is on a shorter duration and they've got other clients and you know basically your common sense tells you that they don't work for you that you know as, as soon as you stop paying they go back to their other accounts then you're fine then you're dealing with a 1099 contractor and I have a lot of people come into me who are like I've got whatever they have I've got 19 employees that are all classified as 1099 contractors what do I do now do I um, go to the government and confess that I've been breaking the law for a really long time? 
or do I just change everyone to a W-2, which is going to reduce their pay? W what do I do from here? And it becomes a very tricky situation. It, we really have to evaluate the risks. And bottom line is it ends up costing the business owner a lot of money because every mistake just costs you a lot of money because you just have to pay somebody not to make your life a living hell. And that's just what it comes down to. So. Um, <clears throat> Next thing, liability insurance. The, the, the secret to understand with, with insurance is that insurance companies are in the business of taking your money and not paying out when you have a claim. That's what they want to do. That's what they're in the profession of doing. What does that mean? That means that you can get whatever insurance that you want to get, a lot of times at whatever price you want to get it at, because they'll encourage you to lie. Like the brokers will sit there and be like, so what is your budget? And then they'll just fill out the form for you. They'll make mistakes and check off the things that give you the lowest possible premium. And they'll be like, I found a carrier who will do this for $1,200 a year. Isn't that great? Everyone else wanted 18,000. And that's great until there's a claim. And then the insurance company is just gonna be like, all right, can we see evidence of everything that you wrote in your application? And if anything turns out not to be true, then you're finished. They're not going to pay the claim. And in fact, the New York State Bar Association recently published a very interesting case where there was a, co a cooperative corporation, what's known as a co-op. And what ended up happening was the management company saved some money by saying they had sprinklers everywhere, that legally they needed to have the sprinklers, but they did not have those sprinklers there. And the co-op, you know, the whole building burned to the ground. They had a fire. And the co-op said, how about them sprinklers? Let's see the evidence that they were working. And they were like, well, they were mostly working. And they said, if they weren't all working, we never would have written that policy. And guess who won? The insurance company. They paid zero. Everybody lost their home. They weren't covered. Done. So point being, on one side, you've got to be very careful to be honest on your insurance applications or you're not going to have insurance. On the other hand, you need to understand just how expensive insurance can get. A lot of people get great government contracts and they're so excited, yes, I'm getting a million dollars to do the electric for this building, you, you, whatever it is that the contract is, and it's their first time and they just don't realize how expensive insurance is. In construction, the liability insurance like the workers' comp can be more money than the person's whole salary, easily, because most people who work in construction end up going on disability. So they need to charge you a fortune. Liability insurance can be very, very costly. At the end of the day, the insurance can be so expensive that people can't fulfill the contract, and they need to go bankrupt to get out of their government contract because the insurance is just choking them. So same thing with uh, my favorite thing again, the commercial lease agreement. Landlords love to just put in all of these requirements for insurance. Because look, it's better if you just buy all the landlord's insurance and, and you buy insurance for everything. That just lets the landlord sleep so much better. That's just great. But the problem is a lot of these policies cost tens of thousands of dollars. And when I'm reviewing a commercial lease for a client, the first thing I do is I take the insurance page and I send it to their favorite insurance broker if they have one. I say, all right, can you give us a quote on this? Tell me like what each of these things is gonna cost. And the brokers are usually like, whoa, that's expensive. And they'll give us a list. This is gonna cost 10,000 a year. This is 4,000 a year. This rider is 6,000 a year. And when I send it to the person, they're like, I can't pay that. I said, of course not. That's why I had you do this ahead of time because I didn't want you to get into the lease and then find out that you're bound to, poli to some kind of policy requirement that you could never in a million years fulfill. And you'll be in default from the day that you sign the lease. And if you think you're gonna, they're gonna let you out, how wrong you are. So, um, all right. So, um, what else? Um, there's investor and venture capital agreements. The thing you need to understand with uh, angel capital, venture capital, anything like that is that no one's on your side. If you, if you have a good business, if you have a good idea, if you're profitable, it's going to be very easy to get venture capital or angel capital because everyone's looking for a good return on their money. Everybody wants to be part of a profitable business. So the problem is that you know they'll take you out for, 
for dinner and for really expensive drinks and tell you, you know, we're gonna put a million in your business, we're gonna put five million in your business, we're gonna put 10 million in your business. And what actually happens, like everything else, if you don't know what to expect, you end up losing hook, line, and sinker. The first thing that happens is you typically don't get a check for that one million or five million or 10 million. You know, they'll invest, you have more like a line of credit that they'll release as they feel it's justified. So, you know, you might get 100,000 to start with the venture capitalist fully controlling the board and, and your salary. And then if they want to put in another 100,000 or another 500,000, they might. They might need more stock in exchange for doing that. They're going to have all kinds of rules in there that basically take away a substantial portion of the founder's upside potential in this whole deal. So when you're going to take venture capital, depending on what the terms are, a lot of times you're going to want off the table money, meaning you look at how many of your rights are being stripped away. And you say, OK, you know what? For this level of giving up my rights, I need a million dollars now, or I need 500,000 now, or I need 2 million now, or whatever it is. And say, well, you're not going to be hungry anymore if we give you a check for a million or 2 million. That's usually what the answer is. So listen, I'm talking to 10 venture capital firms. You're asking me to remain an employee of this company until we have a $50 million exit or a $100 million exit or something that may never happen. In the meantime, if the company doesn't do as well, you're just going to forget about it. And I'm going to be a slave to this thing. So for me to take that level of risk, I'm going to need to ask you for a certain amount of compensation, you know, almost like you're the insurance company. You know, like you're writing the policy for them that you're going to stick around come hell or high water. So if you're going to do that, you need the insurance premium right out of there. And you'll have the negotiating power to ask for that because typically no one's even thinking to give you venture capital unless you're showing great potential. And if you are, they're going to be flocking around you like vultures, all trying to get in on the action because of the profitability or the growth of traffic or whatever it is. So it's really like you know zero or 100, like feast or famine kind of situation. So um, you know, again, you got to just be careful with that. If you're going to buy a franchise or a business, um, you got to keep in mind that people don't usually sell profitable, successful businesses. Usually, people sell because the industry is being disrupted. Something is going wrong. There is lawsuits on the horizon. You know, whatever that person's case is. So typically, when you buy a business, you should be paying a lot less than it feels like the business is worth. And then you can agree on some kind of an earnout over time. Like in other words, someone wants four hundred thousand for the business. Okay, I'm going to put down fifty thousand dollars now, and I'll pay out three hundred fifty from the proceeds of the business. So if it turns out that the business is only worth fifty thousand dollars, hopefully it's not worth less than that. But you know, if it's only worth that, you're not going to be stuck having taken a loan for all of this money that you can't pay back. Now, this is the thing with franchises. I was doing some research into how franchises work for some of my clients, and basically it works like this. A lot of these franchises are front-loaded, meaning you invest a lot of money up front, and then you get your money back over time. So the franchise helps you to get a loan. You have to have a certain amount of liquidity. And then the franchise helps you to go get a loan, usually some kind of an SBA-backed loan or whatever it is. So you get a loan for $100,000, $400,000. Where does it go? It goes straight to the franchisor. It goes straight to the person's pocket, you know, whoever owns the franchise. And then you need to go and fund the business. And hopefully you're going to start making a profit sooner rather than later. But you've got all of that money sunk now right up front. So you really got to be diligent about this. Now, there's also a lot of franchise brokers who are advertising everywhere who you know, seem to be very helpful. They know just what you need. Now, keep this in mind. The good franchises, the, the ones that you've heard of, the ones that you love, they don't typically work with franchise brokers because they don't need to. The, McDonald's doesn't have trouble finding people who want to open a McDonald's. Kinko's doesn't have trouble finding someone who wants to open a Kinko's, a FedEx Kinko's. It's these smaller franchises that no one's ever heard of that very well may go out of business. They're the ones that are paying franchise brokers to go and find them, you know, and find them people. And the franchise brokers make a lot of money, which is why they're so motivated, kind of like real estate brokers. 
and the franchises charge a lot of fees. And again, it's this whole finance system. Everyone's profiting when you take that big loan, the highest loan that you're able to get with your credit, right up front and you pay it over to the franchise. That's when everybody is making bank, so to speak. So that's a reason why generally I'm not a favor, in favor of franchises unless you just have the money to open a McDonald's or you know, some major franchise because you know, you, you're gonna do all this stuff. Then, like say for example, take Papa John's. I had somebody call me and he invested his life savings in a Papa John's and the CEO of Papa John's, you will remember this, he just decided to go shoot off his mouth and say something really stupid. What happened? A lot of people stopped going to Papa John's and my client, who owned a Papa John's, was himself a minority, and he was like, this is just such an unfair situation to me, because I invested in a Papa John's, this guy did this, I'm now totally broke, because no one's going to Papa John's anymore. And if he didn't have a franchise, if he just had like Louie's Pizza Shop on the corner, this wouldn't have happened to him, because as long as he conducted himself in a professional fashion, people would eat his pizza and people would like his pizza and he'd never know the difference, but because he put everything into that Papa John's brand and then Papa John's had a PR problem, boom, he's out of business just like that and so he wants to sue Papa John's of course and that's a whole separate case but in the meantime he can't even pay the rent to take care of his family because uh, you know because of this and that's only one of many ways that you can go under with a franchise um, you, you have to read the franchise disclosure agreement very carefully I'm sorry not the agreement the, the maybe the, it's called the FDD the, the franchise disclosure document and that tells you how many lawsuits they're in how many franchises ha have been taken back and all of this other um, all of these other things that are relevant if you're thinking to get into the franchising business but at any rate, if you can, you're just a lot better if you're gonna take that big loan, just building your own brand, investing in yourself, spending it the right way, and not giving it to people for any reason at all. Commercial lease agreements we already talked about. Um, basically, as you read it over, everything you see in the commercial lease is gonna go against you. And pretty much everything is reversible after you sign the lease for a fee. This is purely a financial situation. So if you want to get out of the lease, if you want to assign the lease, if you want to put up a bigger sign, everything you want to do is going to be a problem until you pay for it. Then the skies clear up and the sun is bright and everything will start going your way as soon as you're able to pay for it. So you really got to read that lease carefully and Think about what are your risks and make sure that you have some kind of a way out. Employment agreements, we talked a bit about employment agreements. You also have to be careful that you have clauses in there such as the non-disclosure, the non-compete, and these are important. The non-disclosure stops your employees from going to a competitor with all of your trade secrets for a higher hourly rate because someone else is like, oh, that, they're doing pretty well. What are they doing? They're like, well, for 30 an hour, I'll be happy to tell you what they're doing and help you do it even better. And if you don't have a non-disclosure, you're gonna have a really hard time stopping them from doing that. Um, Non-compete, a lot of employees will go out and start the same business as you because while you're out struggling and trying to bring in customers, they're sitting there schmoozing with the customers, building relationships, getting to know all about what they like and dislike. And then they just go and they call the customer, like, I'll do the same work for you for half the price. I'm starting my own firm, why don't you come with me? And the customers are gonna be like, oh, sure, you're the person who's been doing all the work for me. Of course, I don't need like that person over there just taking half the profit, and there's no reason. Of course I wanna work with you. So if you don't have a non-compete, that's gonna happen. Um, Non-solicitation means you can't go take your colleagues and quit at the same time. That's really a disaster is when your three best employees all leave to go start a competing business at the same time because there's just some kind of a good versus evil dynamic when you're the business owner. Like the employees all feel like you know, they're the good and you're like the evil boss. And so a lot of times the employees want to go start a business together because they all feel like they're reasonable people and you're terrible. Once they get into business together, they end up in litigation with each other because it's just not that way. 
but people don't realize that. And so that can be disastrous when you lose like your manager, your chief technician, and your chief salesperson all at the same time because one person decided to go start a business or one person decided to leave the company and then they're getting a, a, a commission to solicit other good people, especially in an economy like this. It can just be catastrophic. And so you need to have all of these clauses in there, non-disparagement. You don't want people going on Glassdoor and trashing you if you can. And um, there's really an attitude among people, more, much more now than even 10 years ago, of complete self-entitlement and complete lack of empathy for anyone else. So I've represented a lot of clients in this kind of a situation. And so I'll say to them, you know, it's not really OK to just take all of the company's files and take them over to another firm that's paying you more money and then directly go into competition. And they'll, be, they'll say to me, okay, but I don't care about that. My only question is, where does it say in the contract that I can't do that? And what can you do to me if I do that anyway? Can we have that honest discussion? And I said, sure, we can have the honest discussion. It's not my business. I'm the lawyer. Let me tell you what's going to happen. And then I have to show them where in the contract it says that they can't do that exact thing. And hopefully there's some kind of indemnification clause. Say, well, I'm going to sue you for that. The lawsuit is going to be a public record. You're probably going to need to pay the legal fees because you're probably going to lose. I'm also going to sue the company that you're working with. And so you're probably going to lose that job that you have. And a lot of other people are not going to want to hire you because you're going to have a public record as a thief. So if I were you, I would not want to do that for, for a variety of reasons. And then they'll, most times people are like, oh, so there's actually a pretty big downside to this. I'll say, yeah. They'll say, OK, I think I'm not going to do it. I just didn't understand what I signed. I wish I did not sign that contract. I did not understand because I think that what I want to do is the right thing to do. So I wouldn't have signed this if I had known. Say, it's OK. You wouldn't have, and next time you won't. But this time that you did, so I ask you to obey the law and make all of our lives that much easier. And most people are receptive to that. Most people are afraid of getting sued when they know that they're actually going to lose. Not everyone. Some people are just like, do what you have to do. Like maybe 10% of the people have that reaction. But 90% of the people are like, all right, all right, let, let, let's roll back a little bit. So, um, OK. These are the things we talked about earlier, the independent contractor agreements that you need to be careful about. Um, you're also going to have a lot of issues when you're doing internet kind of work and you have people in different jurisdictions. You have to make sure that you're satisfying the employment law if you have employees in whatever jurisdiction that person happens to be in. In some of my companies that I've run in the past, we had employees in Canada and Mexico and many different states. And the just group of employment laws that we have to satisfy was incredibly challenging because cities make their own employment laws, as you know. So you know we might have 60 employees in 60 different cities. And trying to keep track of all these employment laws, my goodness, it's a full-time job. But you can't break one, because if you break one, like even if you're in New York, you'll have the city of San Francisco suing you for a million dollars. Like, well, you had an employee in San Francisco. San Francisco law applies to people who live in San Francisco. So the city of San Francisco is seeking a million dollars in damages, because you're a company with over 50 employees, which puts you within a, 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 makes you a San Francisco large employer. And you failed to provide mandatory ABC, which be, whatever it is, that became the law two weeks ago. You've been reported, and now I mean, that, has not, that has not happened to me because we managed to comply with all of these laws. It was my full-time job to do that. But it happens to companies all the time. They're totally taken by surprise. So when you hire employees in other places, you have to be careful. Liability insurance, again, you need to understand what you're buying. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, just a quick question about the non-solicitation mm -hmm. um, clause. So you were saying like if you had, if there's three employees and they all decide to leave and go open up a separate business, and if they're successful in that business, mm -hmm. can they be made, like let's say they make enough money where if they are sued, they can pay um, whatever it is. Um, can they be made to shut down their business or can they continue to operate? 
Well, if you can, first of all, if you have a contract on your side, that really helps because it makes it easy. The judge can just read the contract and say, did you sign this? And the answer is, unless it's unconscionable and you try to draft the contract so that it's not unconscionable, meaning that there's limitations on the non-solicitation, like if for a year or two years or whatever it is. So you, know, you make sure it's not unconscionable when you draft it. But assuming it's not unconscionable and they stole your trade secrets in direct violation of the contract, then yes, you can sue them for stealing whatever that they've stolen and you can bankrupt the company with the judgment that you receive and you can get a restraining order stopping them from doing that as well if it's really bad. If you don't have a contract that gives you any of those rights, it's gonna be a lot harder. It's really gonna be a he said, she said, where they're gonna be like, I'm the one who thought of that trade secret. That's not a trade secret. I knew that or even better, I've got every right to do that. I'm the one who thought of it. Why can't I do that? And we can make the argument that it's just inherently wrong or you know, it's tortious interference with a profitable business relationship. We can sue with a lot of, for a lot of different things, but it can be really challenging. In fact, I, um, <clears throat> you know, I had a case that I worked on which was a total emergency where somebody was a, um, you know, was a, basically a very well-recognized contractor who was absolutely fearless because she was rich and very well-respected. And she was just like, I'm untouchable. And to a large degree, that was true. Like, everybody was afraid of her and nobody wanted to bring her to justice. But, you know, what ended up happening was she took an independent, con she took a contract for, you know, she learned about millions of dollars in contracts. Then she just called up all of the clients and she said, just go ahead and break your contracts. Don't worry about it. My attorney will take care of any lawsuits that happen. In the meantime, she lured everybody by saying, I'm going to give you all kinds of benefits and value-added things you're not getting from your current company. I'm going to introduce you to the most important people in the industry. I'm going to get you leads that are going to make your whole career. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So what happens is, like most of the people left, they were like, that sounds great to me. I'm going to go and do that. And so you know, we had to go into court and be like, she has a contract. It specifically says she won't do A, B, C, D, E, and F. But she's just fearless, and she could not care less. And she's like, I'm just not afraid of the law. I'm not afraid of the courts. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And so we were successfully able to get a restraining order. The judge, typically judges don't like restraining people in violation of the First Amendment. But in this case, she was so fearless about it that I was able to walk in and say to the judge, look at what she's doing. Look at what she's saying. This is complete disregard for any legal obligation she has. And the, the judge was just like, wow, wow, this is really something. And she didn't even show up in court because she could not even be bothered to show up in court. And so, but still, it's very hard to get a restraining order even if the person doesn't show up. And so, you know, we did get a restraining order and then she had to go and write to the clients and say, you know, because these wicked evil people went to court and got a restraining order against me, I can't continue doing what I promised to do right now because it's gonna put me in violation of a state Supreme Court order. But don't worry, I'm going to try and get this taken care of and then we'll be back to business again. And then she ended up taking it to federal court from state and they vacated the order and she was back to business doing just the same thing. And eventually the, it settled, but bottom line is that you've gotta be as careful as you can. And if there weren't all of these contracts already in place, then this person would have been invincible. It was only the fact that all of these contracts existed that gave us any kind of leverage to even get that restraining order to begin with. So, um, you know, anyway, point being that, you know, they, they say that maybe 10 to 15% of the people out there are psychopaths, and that's true, or sociopaths, whatever they call it, and that's really true. There's a lot of people who are very charismatic and very friendly and very charming, but they're fully planning to rob you as soon as they can do it. 
And so, you know, you just really have to be on guard as much as you possibly can because, again, like, a lot of these people are truly fearless. They don't even care what's in the contract. You're going to need to use your contract to stop them from what they otherwise will be fearless to do. Um, okay, loans and lines of credit. You've got to be very careful with loans. This is probably not the first time you've heard this, but loans are expensive. If you ever look at what's called an amortization table for a loan that, and you can pull this up online, for a loan that you're planning to take, um, it'll tell you what you're going to pay. If you only pay the minimum back on it, a lot of times you're going to end up paying double or triple the amount that you borrowed. It's quite shocking. So, for example, you may borrow, I don't know, $150,000, and if you look at the amortization table, the way it's structured, you're paying almost all interest at the beginning. So say it's a five-year loan or a 10-year loan, and you say, oh, great, I have an SBA loan. This is just fantastic. Um, it's at a good rate, whatever it is. Okay, if you need the money, yeah, it's great that you got it, but you gotta understand, maybe you're gonna make a payment of $1,500 the first month, $1,400 of that may go to interest, and $100 may be going to principal. So say you decide you wanna pay it off two years later, they're gonna be like, you owe $89,000. And you're gonna say, how could it be? I made so many $1,500 payments. How could I still owe 89000 And they're going to say, well, the way that this is structured is first you pay all the interest, then you pay all the principal. So if you held the loan for the full 10 years, at the end you would be paying only principal, but at the beginning you pay only interest. So not only on a $100,000 loan, $150,000 loan, might you be paying $250,000 or $300,000 over the term of the loan, but it's structured in such a way that if you're able to pay it off early, you're gonna lose a lot of your benefit. So this is completely acceptable in the world of banking. This is just absolutely standard. So bottom line is you really need to be careful. Like banks love throwing at you business lines of credit and, um, SBA loans and building loans and all these other things. And if you're experienced and you know what you're doing, you're taking an expensive bridge loan because you've been in construction for a while and you know what it's going to be worth, you're partnered with someone who knows what buildings are worth, then fine. I have a lot of clients who take expensive bridge loans and they make a fortune, but they know what they're doing. If you don't know what you're doing and you take one of these big loans to buy a business or a franchise or whatever it is, that, along with your rent, is going to make it impossible to make a profit, or it could make it impossible to make a profit even if you are in a situation where you're making good money from sales, you still could just find it impossible to pay your bills. Now, something you need to also be careful about is the right of offset. This is something that kills people, that no one knows about for whatever the reason is is most people take loans from the same bank that they keep their life savings in because they have a relationship with that bank. There's something called offset. That means that if you default on your loan that you have to the bank by not making a payment or two or whatever it is, they can offset their losses by taking any other money that you have with the bank. Now you gotta remember, there's that acceleration clause. That's not just for commercial leases, that's also for loans. So if you have a $300,000 loan and you miss a payment or two, then the full 300,000 becomes due. So if you've got, say, $45,000, and that's your life savings for your business, you've got in your account, you're just gonna see it vanish, gone. You're gonna go, they're gonna, it's gonna say zero. And you call up the bank, what happened? Oh, we offset, we offset. And even if you file a bankruptcy, even the bankruptcy is not going to take that back because they have a super right to offset. And they're going to do that before you even file. So you're just going to lose your money. And people call me up hysterical crying and they're like, I'm homeless now. I had money. I had plenty of money before. Now I'm homeless. The bank took everything from me. I missed a few payments. They took everything. You know, I don't know what to tell you. you know, you're going to have to go to a counselor, get benefits, figure something out. We'll file bankruptcy to get rid of your debt. As soon as people come to me in a bankruptcy situation, the first thing I'll say to them is, do you keep your money 
in the same bank that you have a loan from? And if the answer is yes and you're in default, you better put your money elsewhere or the bank is going to offset and you know, you're gonna, you could end up being tragically sorry. So if you learn nothing else from this whole speech, just knowing that offset exists could make it worth your time in states. All right, um, see what we got next here. Venture capital and angel financing, we also talked a little bit about that. Um, I don't have much more to add to what I already said other than to just make sure you really understand your VC deal or your angel deal or any of those things because it's not structured to satisfy you. There's a lot of people who have had these beautiful exits and then you see them working at you know, some job, you know, making like $100,000 a year, whatever it is, and we're like, but I don't understand. Like you had a $20 million exit, you had a $30 million exit, how are you, you know, just working as a CPA at a CPA firm? Why aren't you in skiing somewhere? And they're like, how much of that exit money do you think that I saw? I'm like, how much? They'll be like, I'm like, how? They'll say, well, you know, I did not understand what I was signing. The venture capitalist got every dime of it. There was just nothing left for me. And a lot of times the reason why is because they'll be like, your rights don't start until we have a $50 million exit. So if there's like a beautiful $25 million exit, you might not qualify for anything because you have not hit the goal. Like it's a painful loss for the venture capital firm I mean, not really, I'm being sarcastic here, because they would not have put their money with you if they thought they were only going to exit at 25 million. They thought you were going to be the next photo bucket or the next Facebook, and you badly failed them. So as a result, you may just see zero, because all of their shares need to be redeemed before your shares, because they've got preferred shares of stock, and you've got common shares, and they have agreements that they can redeem for more shares and all of these things. So that's such a common story that people exit for tens of millions of dollars and don't get anything for themselves. Again, if you've got a good business, it doesn't have to be that way, but you have to recognize what's going on. And typically, they'll have you work with their lawyers. They're gonna be like, oh, you know, you work with our firm, just, just like real estate brokers. And that lawyer does not have an interest in educating you appropriately about what you're dealing with because they're making so much money in referrals from that VC firm. So you may not hear this from anyone else except for Bradley Balin. Like half the things that I'm saying here, you may not hear from anyone except Bradley Balin, but it's a good thing that you're here because now you know. Um, online marketing agreements, um, people lose their shirt in marketing. Marketing looks so sexy. They have a way of look, making it look like it's a sure thing. And a lot of the time, it's fraud. And you just lose your money, but still you owe it under the contract. And I'm going to give you an example. When you know, I ran a pretty large company, and I was interviewing people as full-time marketing manager, and someone who interviewed with me, he was in charge of marketing for a major, major magazine. And I was like, so what did you do for the magazine? And he's like, well, my job was to buy the cheapest garbage traffic by advertising online and drive it all to the magazine. So the, w the way that it would work is somebody, so they get an advertiser, say, who wants to advertise a top dollar because this is a very respectable online publication. And so they'll make like a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollar purchase, which will guarantee them a certain number of views, 10,000 views, 15,000 views, whatever it is. Okay, so he's like, we don't naturally have that many views. Now we have to go out and deliver that many views. So we need to run all of these ads that just say like, click here to enter a contest for a free steak or you know, whatever it is that we need to do, or you know, like something that just tricks them and just redirects their browser to the site. You know, basically, he's like, my job is to drive huge amounts of traffic to satisfy these large orders from major publications. And I was like, so someone thinks that they're buying, you know, that they're advertising to like, I don't know what, to 10,000 New York Times readers. And again, this was not the New York Times that was doing this, but it was the equivalent of that. And so they think they're spending a lot of money to reach this very affluent, educated group of people. And meanwhile, the publication is sitting there like just advertising on, I don't even know where they're buying this traffic from, to satisfy the quota. And then they're sending the person the bill for $150,000 and being like, done. 
So it's totally foreseeable that a lot of other, not just foreseeable, it happens all the time. I have a lot of bankruptcy clients who are in marketing, come to me for bankruptcy who are in marketing. And you know they're playing all of these games, and they end up going bankrupt when their fraud is discovered. And a lot of times they're downline, they don't even realize that the person above them is using fraudulent technology because they're buying the traffic from someone who's buying the traffic from someone who's buying the traffic from someone who's getting it from a black box. And no one knows where the traffic is originating except for a dude in Russia. And at the end of the day, someone figures out that they're being defrauded because they're just not making any sales. And um, it turns into a mess. But meanwhile, some small business owner ends up having spent $100,000 on this advertising, and now they're totally broke, or $10,000, or you know, whatever the case may be. And there's so many similar examples of this kind of thing. So again, if you don't understand what you're doing, start small. Do a small purchase. And if it goes well and you know what you're doing, do a little bit bigger purchase and a little bit bigger purchase. Don't just go for broke and just go all in on anything, no matter what it is or who it is, because it's not going to work out the way that you intended. Um, another example, this is something I want you to know. This is something which is very common, is small business owners run into large companies like, I like what you sell and I want to buy it. I want to put it in all of my stores because it's a great product. And maybe it is. But a lot of times, these larger companies, they systematically go bankrupt. For a lot of small companies and individuals, you feel like going bankrupt is a terrible thing to do. It's the last thing that you want to do. It's your worst nightmare to go bankrupt. But for larger companies, this is absolutely par for the course. It's just a way to take huge risks and get rid of all of your debt at the end of the day. It's absolutely standard. And so for a lot of these companies, what they need to do is just find people who don't realize that they went bankrupt a few years ago and that they're ready to go bankrupt again. And so um, they'll, for example, you might be a manufacturer of Jiminy Crickets. And they're really good. So they'll call you and be like, we need 75,000 Jiminy Crickets for Toys R Us. And you say, all right, great. You go take a loan to make, you know, we have net 120 day payment terms, net 180 day payment terms, meaning you deliver the Jiminy's now and they're going to pay you in 180 days for everything they were able to sell. We're going to put them in a great shelf in a great location. The last toy manufacturer who worked with us, they sold so many. Okay, wonderful. Then we know what happened to Toys R Us. Well, maybe not, maybe we don't all know, but they just went bankrupt. So everyone they owe money to, kaput. That's it. They're not paying that money. So, um, so that's how that works. And a lot of small businesses that come to me for bankruptcy, they literally have done nothing wrong. They've been in business for generations and generations. And usually what ends up happening is the kids took over from the mother and father, and the kids just haven't seen this before. And so the mother and father are out there retired or doing whatever it is that they're doing, and the kids don't realize. And so the company will be like, can you send us more? Can you send us more? The CFO is on vacation right now. Um, you know, we've got that big check for you. It's just, you know, we just got a new CFO. Whatever the excuse is, they're just putting you off so they can keep making revenue while they're getting their bankruptcy in order. And a lot of times people don't realize it's until it's too late. Then they call me hysterical and they're like, they've got everything. Like, you know, they, like Toys R Us called us or National Wholesale Liquidators called us. We just figured, you know, they're like a Fortune 500. What could ever go wrong? They're a big company. And we just got a notice of bankruptcy. You're now bankrupt too. I hope you don't owe people too much money. I'd hate to see the same thing happen to them. But anyway, bottom line is be aware of it and understand that if someone has something, if someone likes something that you have, you have the right to demand stronger payment terms if it's going to be costing you a lot of money. You have every right to say, I cannot give you net 180, uh, or at least not for an order of that size. There's a whole art to assessing how much credit you should give someone, and I would love to teach a class on that. But bottom line of it is you need to be careful if you're not otherwise capable of researching who you're giving the credit to, then you could just say, listen, you can't build up a debt of more than $10,000 or $15,000. You know, like, I'll give you net 60 or net 90, but 
I can't let you place more orders until you take care of the money you already owe. Now understand these larger companies, they don't need to do net 180 a million times. I've seen them pay the next day. All they do is they just get permission from the right manager to have the accounting department cut the check now because they want to do it. They tell you, you know, we have strict policies, you know, we're a publicly traded company, we have to stick to very strict routines. The reality is they don't need to stick to any routines. The only routine they need to stick to is documenting what they did and why they did it. But beyond that, they are, they're totally capable of making a payment early, of agreeing to different payment terms if that's what they want to do. And you know, if you've got a great Jiminy Cricket and they need it, you have every right to say, I need you to you know, put down $30,000 ahead of time to help with the manufacturing costs. I need, you know, whatever it is you need, you can fully negotiate with them. And if they want what you're selling, it absolutely will work and they will agree. And at a minimum, they'll say, okay, maybe instead of net 180, we can do net 90. And I said, okay, fine, if you can live with that, net 90 and um, you know, not more than a fifth, I'm, I can't give you more than $15,000 in credit. So if they're selling well, I'm gonna need you to start paying faster so that I can send you the next shipment. And believe me, if you're selling well, they'll rush that money to you. They'll give you an advance. They'll do whatever they need to do because they're selling well. A big company is no different than a small company. It's just that they have a lot of prestige factor and so sometimes you just don't realize that and you give them more negotiating power than they really should have. Um, so um, <clears throat> one other piece of advice that I want to give that will help get you out of trouble is they have something called Know Your Customer. It's mandatory for banks. It's not mandatory for non-financial institutions. But boy, is it helpful, these Know Your Customer checklists and stuff like that. Basically, what it involves is systematically using common sense to evaluate what is the likelihood that this is going to be a successful transaction versus a fraudulent transaction. And you know, there's all these things in the checklist you can look at, but one of those things, for example, is, is this the kind of business that would typically do business with a business like my own? You know, so for example, say, you know, Goldman Sachs calls me and they say, Bradley, we want you to be our lead counsel. We want you to supervise all 10,000 lawyers who work for us. Will you accept our offer? What should I be thinking, right? You'll be thinking, Really? Me? You know, I mean, this is what you typically, you know, this is typically what you'd hire, you know, a 10,000 person law firm for that. You wouldn't hire a solo practitioner. So if someone calls with something like that, what do you expect? You expect that it's fraud, that they have nothing to do with Goldman Sachs or whoever it is, that it's literally just some kind of a fraud or something that they're saying is incorrect. Maybe they're a contractor for them and it's not really the company, but they're a contractor, and so they want me to provide the legal services, and then they're gonna get paid by the client, and then they're never gonna pay me. This happens with government contracts all the time, and so on and so forth. So it's fraud. I don't know how it's fraud, because I need to go through the know your customer list and go through the checklist, but once I do that, I'm gonna figure out that it's fraud, because it just doesn't ring true. It just doesn't make sense. So, um, and most of the time, that's how you're going to catch fraud, is just by people making you promises that don't make any sense, or that sound too good to be true. If it sounds too good to be true, it always is. We talked about franchise agreements. Um, you know, we talked a bit about buying a business. Um, okay, so <clears throat> now say things begin to get tight for whatever the reason is. What are you actually going to do when things get tight? Um, your options can, continue, can be continuing to run the business on loans from banks, family, or friends, getting a new business partner or a lender who's going to give you cash, slimming down your operations, selling more, collecting your receivables faster, or putting the business in bankruptcy. Those are going to be what your options are, and you can do some of them, or all of them, depending on what your circumstances, one after the next after the next. But the one thing that you want to be careful of <clears throat> is just don't be in denial of what your situation is because denial is going to take away all your options. Okay. Now, one of the first mistakes that people make 
when they're starting a business <clears throat> is not having excellent control over their finances. What does that mean? When you take all these courses on starting a business or you know, business plan, they tell you, you, know, you need to have all of these fancy budgets. And it helps, I, it helps. I, the more meticulous you are, the better. But the reality is that QuickBooks is hard to use. Bookkeepers are expensive. Budgeting takes a lot of time and it's boring. And there's a million reasons why you won't do it. But what you do need to do is 1% of what everybody tells you you need to do. Basically, you just need to write down what money you took in, and, and you can just do this in Excel, like just what you took in and where it came from and what you spent, at least the large expenditures, and what you spent it on. That can be like in a week, that could be six lines in Excel, that's it. Just like, you know, I sold 30 bottles of vodka, I sold 45 bottles of beer, you know, whatever that, that you sold, I paid the vodka distributor, this much money, I paid the beer distributor, this much money, I paid this much for rent, and so on and so forth. And the reason that you need to do that is because otherwise you're not gonna know what's happening with your business, because what happens is, say you get close to the end of the year, everybody wants their tax write-offs, they want to advance their expenses. And so you're gonna have a lot of people paying early, and you might feel like you're on top of the world because all of a sudden, like, I've never seen this much money in my life as is currently in my bank account. And spend more and be like, good, now I can buy more inventory and all these other things. Then the next month, no one pays because they all paid early or for the next two months. And now you actually can't pay the rent, you can't pay your loans, sales have dropped because everybody's broke in January and because they spent all the money during Christmas season. And, um, now you're like, oh my goodness, well, I can't even stay in business anymore. And so um, now, if you knew what that trend looked like, just by having this basic information written, then you would know what happened. You'd be able to look at it and say, hmm, why did my numbers go like that? They went like that because a bunch of people paid early. So in December, you're gonna know you're not doing as well as you think you're doing. And in January, you're gonna know you're not doing as bad as you think you're doing. You're gonna be able to <clears throat> average everything out and know what's going on. Plus, you're gonna remember things like the insurance premium comes twice, is due twice a year, and you have to spread out the insurance premium. So when you look at what your expenses were over the past six months, you're like, oh, right, right, right. You know, I can't feel too rich because I'm gonna to have to pay the insurance again in two months. And you know, there might be a client who didn't pay you. And one of the worst things that happens to companies is not knowing who's paid and how much they paid. And it seems like it could never happen, but it happens all the time. Someone comes in and they just give you $1,000 for whatever it is, you put it in your pocket and you're busy making sales and you just forget about it. And <clears throat> they're gonna be like, oh, I paid, I paid you all 4,000. And you're like, I don't think you did, did you? And you're looking and you just don't have the records. You're like, where could the records be? Tell me I wrote this down, please. Don't tell me I have no idea. And you just don't have it written down. They're gonna be like, no, remember, I came in on January 1st, I gave you $2,000. Then three months later, I came in and I gave you the difference. I don't forget things like this. I write everything down. Here's where I gave you the first 2,000. Here's where I gave you the second 2,000. And if you don't have it written down, then you're gonna be in trouble because you're just not even gonna know. So it's so helpful to just have these rough notes written down. Like I got 2,000 from John Doe and nothing else. Cause you try to get everything into QuickBooks, you're gonna end up having nothing in QuickBooks cause it's just too much, it's too confusing. When you're larger and you can afford a bookkeeper, you'll do it. But when you're first getting started, just do a little bit at a time. Just do something rather than nothing. One time they were interviewing Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and he was saying, it was very inspirational, um, you know, he was basically saying, don't tell me that you can't be big because you don't need to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. The way you become me is you do one push-up. At least I believe that was what he said. He said, don't tell me you can't do anything. He's like, get on the floor and do one push-up if that's what you can do. There's a huge difference between one and zero. Once you're there, you just might do two because you're there 
And if you're that motivated, eventually you may look like me, but it doesn't start looking like me. It starts with one single push-up, with one single sit-up, and you don't need a gym for that, you don't need weights for that. All you need is a floor and two hands is all you need to do push-ups. So there's no excuse not to be doing it. So, you know, so that's the, that's the bottom line with that. Um, all right, income. Excuse me, I'm sorry, yeah. I just have a question about um, income tax returns. Yeah. Uh, so, like the last company I worked for, our fiscal year didn't start until um, April 1st. Mm -hmm. Does, what, does, um, like, your fiscal year, does that matter in terms of um, filing your taxes? Is it easier to start your fiscal year closer to like April 15th or is it better to just do from January to December in terms of just filing taxes? All right, well, I'm, I can't say anything authoritative because I'm not a CPA, but I've almost never seen a fiscal year other than January through December because there's just no good reason to do that. Okay. And larger corporations do it all the time, yeah. but for a small business, it just adds confusion, because except for the city of New York, everybody uses a fiscal year of January to December. New York City starts in July, but everyone yeah. else orders, uh, you know, you know, does January through December, so it's like, why would you just be different than everyone else? I and never understood why we did April 1st to, to like, March 30th, like that was our fiscal year. There's like reasons fiscal why, year, but um, with a tiny business, yeah. I, I can't think of any good reason why. Okay. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> now if you're ever gonna need help with your finances, because if you, cause you're gonna take a loan, or you're gonna work with a consultant, or <clears throat> anything like that, um, there's some things you're just gonna need. You're gonna need a profit and loss statement. You're gonna need income tax returns for the past two years, copies of your leases. This is just a list of the basic things that you need to do any kind of financial analysis. And it matches very closely if you're gonna file bankruptcy with what you need if you file bankruptcy. This is what you have to bring to the bankruptcy court so you can explain to the trustee why it is that you can't pay any of your creditors. Um, or many of your creditors. So understand these are important documents, and everyone has a copy of the packet. So um, you know, you've got a list of everything that's here, or at least you should. Um, it's helpful to have a budget. It's helpful to have a business plan. All of these things are helpful if it's realistic and it makes sense to you, and at least you've been in business a little while and you understand what you're trying to do. If it's just an exercise in raw fiction, then doesn't do anything for you, it's better to just have a few weeks of, week of records of what you spent in the past. And based on that, just make a budget for one week or two weeks or a month or whatever it is, just so you know if you're gonna go out of business at the end of the month or not. I mean, literally, I'm not being trying to be funny about that. It really helps, like a lot of times it's helpful to just look back at the past month and make an, a budget just for the next week or two weeks or the next month. So you have an understanding of whether you can pay your employees or whether you should let go of everyone now so that you have enough money to pay the rent or start making people part-time or whatever the case may be. <clears throat> How do you get employees and creditors on board? A lot of times you need to just talk to people about getting rid of debt. And one of the easiest ways to do that is just to have an honest discussion with people about the fact that you just can't pay it. And they'll be cooperative. Um, so usually you want, and this includes employees too, when you're telling people you're not gonna be able to give them their vacation, you're gonna need to cut their salary, that you know all these different things are gonna happen. You need to be friendly but firm. And you wanna show people that you're treating everyone fairly. A lot of companies, they'll come and they don't need to file bankruptcy, they just need to go out of business and not pay anyone they owe money to, which they can do if there's no personal guarantees, but they just don't wanna end up with litigation. And so one of the purposes of business bankruptcy is just to show that everyone's being treated fairly, to show transparency. But that's not just an issue with bankruptcy, that's an issue with all of employment, is that you wanna show 
that everybody's being treated fairly. When people feel that they're being treated unfairly, that's where all of your problems come from. That's where complaints to government agencies come from. That's where lawsuits come from. That, that's, that's just where all problems originate, is people feeling that lack of transparency. So you, know, you need to go to the employee, to go to your vendors, and just say to them, um, you know, listen, I'm paying everybody 10, 10 cents on the dollar, and that's all I can do. If I don't have agreement from most people, then I'm going to have to pay zero. So, you know, you tell me I don't have more. I'll give you a copy of my financials so you can see what the company has left. And I'll give you a list of who I owe the money to if you want. And that's it. I can pay 10 cents on the dollar. I've got 10,000 left in my account. And that's what I'm going to do. And if someone's like, well, you should pay personally, I say, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't have a legal obligation to do that. And I'm not going to do that. You know, what I have to distribute is the money I've got left in the account. And if you've got nothing, you can just turn around and listen. I just want to say I'm sorry. You know, maybe, if, you know, you want to say it face to face or whatever. So I thought things were going to go better. They did not go well. The company is completely bust. I'm not going to be able to pay you. If you want to sue, I can't stop you from doing that. But the company's bankrupt and you're not going to get any money at the end of the day. It's just going to be a waste of your time. But in, I'm going to start another company. And when I do, I'm going to do business with you again. We'll do it on better terms. If possible, let's not end on bad terms because I think there's a lot more of all of us. And when you do that, a lot of times people, you know, they're not happy. They're like, all right, let me think about it. This is hard. But usually they'll come back and say, I understand. I'm, I'm not happy. And if you come into more money, please pay me. But I, I, I understand. Thank you for being strong about it and looking me in the eye and telling me what's going on rather than hiding. Because it's that lack of transparency that makes people, uh, you know, that makes people feel bad. So, um, and same thing with employees. You say I'm lowering everyone's salary. And by the way, when you pay people, it's really better to pay all the employees the same amount of money. Or if there's going to be a difference, have it be for a very clear reason what the difference is. Because everybody loves talking about their salary. And so if you end up having different pay for different people, everyone's going to hate your guts. Everyone's going to be filing complaints with the government. You really, you'll find it so much easier to just say, like, a customer service job pays 45000 plus certain benefits, if that's what it is. And everybody who starts here starts at the same amount of money. And you're eligible for up to a 5% raise after 12 months on the job if your reviews are whatever they are. But it really has to be as standard as you can possibly make it because everybody talks and everybody's looking for a reason to feel they're not being treated fairly. So if you're going to have a successful business, you need to go through contortions to show that you're being fair, to have objective standards for everything that you do. So when someone says, you're, I wasn't treated fairly, you have to say, and by the way, if there's a government charge, that's literally what the government will say to you, is they're going to say, well, what is your criteria? Let's just see if everyone is treated by the same criteria. And if you don't have written criteria, they're going to be like, so it's, it's what you feel like. It's not based on anything objective. It's, it's what you feel like. And if that, the answer is yes, you're really in trouble. You want to be like, no, this is the criteria for a raise. This is the criteria for a promotion. This is the criteria for overtime. And we stick to that criteria rigidly. This person came, to late, came late five times. Every time someone comes late, we put a letter in the file and we speak to them. Here's the five letters. Here's the notes from each of those conversations that we had. This person was fired on an absolutely objective basis. You come late five times, you get fired. That's our rule. And everyone who comes late gets the same treatment. And um, <clears throat> you know, so that really helps. So um, in terms of options, so I'm going to move a little faster here because what I already talked about is really the point of what I wanted to communicate. The rest of these things are not relevant, so relevant at this point. So we're going to just zoom through it. Options to restructure and refinance debt or any of these things, debt consolidation plans, debt consolidation loans, credit counseling, bankruptcy, all of these things. Um, now, I'm just going to go through bankruptcy very, very quickly. In five, I'm going to do a five-minute overview of bankruptcy. Basically, what bankruptcy does is it allows you to get rid of some or all of your debt. It's, say, 
I don't have enough money left to pay my creditors. I'm broke. I need all of my debts gone. You can have a debate about whether that's right, wrong, ethical, unethical, but it sure works. And it's a great thing to know about. And um, a lot of times you're going to take major risks. And if it doesn't work out, that's how you're going to be getting rid of your debt is by filing bankruptcy. It should be part of your exit strategy. You should understand it. Basically, there's two types of bankruptcy you can do. There's personal bankruptcy and there's business bankruptcy. A bit, unless you sign for person, unless you take personal liability on your business contracts, you are not liable to pay your creditors on a business contract. So in other words, any contract where you sign it as CEO of the business, not personally, if the business runs out of money, the business does not need to pay those debts. The only exception to that rule, other than personal having taken personal liability, is if the business was not operating properly, like if you were treating it as your personal piggy bank, if you were not observing the corporate formalities, if you're not treating it like a company, if you're just treating it like your personal bank account. Like, so if you never took the company seriously, the government's not gonna take the company seriously, and they're gonna say it's not a real company. But as long as you observe the basic corporate formalities that you need to observe, and you have enough money in the company, and you don't put all your personal expenses on the company's account, then you can just walk away from your company and you, the creditors are gonna get stuck for all of the debt and they'll get whatever assets you might have, but that's it. So like if you have a commercial lease for $400,000 and you can't pay it and only the company's name is on the lease, then which some landlords will do because you gave them enough security or they were desperate, whatever the case may be, then done, you walk away, you're done. You don't need to file bankruptcy. They say a, a business bankruptcy is almost like a, a fancy funeral. You don't need to do it, but you can do it just to show everyone that you're being fair. So um, if your business is doing really well, you can pay some of your debt, but not all of your debt, by doing what's known as a chapter 11. I'm not gonna get into what it is, but basically if you wanna keep your business running and you're making good money, and I mean good money, but you just have too much debt, then you can get rid of a lot of it by doing a chapter 11, which lets you get rid of and restructure a lot of your debt. Um, personally, a lot of people who come to me for bankruptcy, they come personally because they signed documents taking, guaranteeing the commercial lease, where they put everything on their company credit card. Most people can file personal bankruptcy and get rid of all of that liability still. It doesn't help your credit in the short term, but boy does it work. And depending on the size of your family, you can make a lot of money and have a pretty decent amount of money in your bank account and still get rid of all of your debt, especially if you go out of business and you don't have another job, so you have no source of income. You can get rid of a lot of debt. I don't remember offhand what the numbers are, but it's something like if you are one person, you can make like fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year. You can have, if you own a home, you can have up to one hundred seventy thousand dollars in mortgage on. I'm, I'm sorry, in equity in the home, and you're still okay to file bankruptcy. Which so almost everyone who owns a home can file bankruptcy. The home won't stop them in that regard because when you add one hundred seventy thousand to your mortgage, it's going to be more than your house is worth. So most people are considered to have zero equity in their home. So if your income is not particularly high and you don't have a large amount of savings, you can just wipe out your debt. And the cool thing about this is you can wipe out lawsuit debt. So for example, I had someone call me and he was an ATM installer and I guess he bungled a lot of contracts and he received a lot of money which he had since spent. And so he was getting sued for many hundreds of thousands of dollars because apparently installing an ATM is a very costly thing to do. I don't know, $80,000, 50, I don't know why, but it's expensive. So he was hired to do many of them. He bungled all the jobs. He was getting sued for hundreds of thousands. He's like, I can't pay this. I spent the money. I, I, I can't do anything with this. So he just needed to file bankruptcy and that'll just get rid of the lawsuit. You don't have to pay a lawyer to deal with the lawsuit. You just file bankruptcy and all liabilities disappear with the exception of liability for things that are considered evil. Like for example, if you stole money from someone, you can't file bankruptcy on that. If you have liability for a drunk driving accident, you can't 
file bankruptcy on that. If you went nuts with your credit card a week before filing bankruptcy with the intent to not pay for what you've charged, you'll have to pay for that. You know, things that are considered just corrupt, they'll leave you with, but anything which is just honest, a ton, honestly a ton of debt that you can't pay back, like those SBA loans, you can go bankrupt on those SBA loans and get rid of them. And a lot of times, for a lot of people, there's nothing wrong with their ability to make money in business. They just screwed up a lot of things because it was their first go around. And the relationships they have are still good. The knowledge they have is still good. The technical skills they have are still good. They just need to get rid of that SBA loan and that credit card debt and that commercial lease liability and all these other things. And so they'll do that by just filing bankruptcy and then starting another company. And so you should not be afraid of bankruptcy. You should understand it and understand your rights because a lot of those people who make millions and hundreds of millions and billions, filing bankruptcy is very much a part of their business model. They take enormous risks with the understanding that they'll file bankruptcy if they need to and get rid of a lot of that stuff. So I warned you about other people doing that to you. You know, you need to understand that you're going to have that option as well. You just have to be careful that if you have a lot of money in your own name, that you need to put that in some form of a trust or do something with it before you go taking personal liabilities and making personal guarantees, because otherwise it could stop you from filing bankruptcy if you have too much money in the bank. But um, and again, personally, if you are making good money, you can also reduce your debt down to what you could afford to pay, which is usually a pretty good reduction by doing a chapter 13. It's the personal equivalent of a chapter 11. Um, basically, it's where you say, listen, I make money. I'm not eligible to pay my creditors nothing, but I need to pay a lot less money than I currently owe. So you, know, you can do that. And um, a lot of times, you end up paying pennies on the dollar, even when you're earning well over $100,000 a year as long as your expenses justify it. And really, the bankruptcy system is very generous. And it's not, you don't need to be vagrant to file bankruptcy. You just need to be less successful than the average person. I mean, that's pretty much where they get the standard from, is what does the average person make? So if you're in worse shape than the average person, then typically you can file bankruptcy. <laughs> and most people that I meet are in worse shape than the average person. I don't know where they get the average person who has so much money, but usually when people need to file bankruptcy, we're just fine in terms of the income requirements. So in your packet, you've got all these examples of chapter seven, chapter 13, chapter 11. I'm not gonna go through those now. You're welcome to call me and I'll answer any questions or email me. I'll answer any questions that you have about it. Um, if there is, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask now. The presentation is finished. Questions? No, no questions? I bored everybody to death. No. <laughs> all right, so we're all, so we're all set then. If, um, if, if anyone wants to give their commentary on how you felt I did for the camera, if you're willing to be on camera, please feel free to do that. If not, you will not be on camera for any reason whatsoever. You have my personal guarantee about that. It's only pointed at me. And we're all set. Thank you, Thank you for coming. <laughs>